Just a few minutes ago, uh, I took this picture uh, about 10 blocks from here. This is the Grand Cafe uh, here in Oxford. I took this picture because this turns out to be the first coffee house to open in England in, in 1650. That's its great claim to fame. And I wanted to show it to you not because I want to give you the kind of, you know, Starbucks tour of historic England, uh, but rather because the English coffee house was crucial to the development uh, and spread of one of the great intellectual flowerings uh, of the last 500 years, what we now call the Enlightenment. And the coffee house played such a big role in, in the birth of the Enlightenment, in part because of what people were drinking there, right? Because before the, uh, the, the spread of coffee and, and tea through British culture, what people drank, both elite and, and mass folks drank day in and day out from, from dawn until dusk was alcohol, right? Alcohol was the daytime beverage of choice. You would drink a little beer with breakfast and have a little wine at lunch, a little gin, particularly around 1650, um, and uh, top it off with a little beer and, and wine at the end of the day. That was the healthy choice, right? Because the water wasn't safe to drink. Uh, and so effectively, in, until the rise of the coffee house, you had an entire population that was effectively drunk all day. Um, <laughs> And you can imagine what that would be like, right, in your own life, and I know this is true of some of you, if you were drinking all day, and, and then you switched from a depressant to a stimulant in your life, you would have better ideas. Um, you would be sharper and more alert, and so it's not an accident that a great flowering of innovation happened uh, as England switched to, to tea and coffee. But the other thing that makes the coffee house important is the, is the architecture of the space. It was a space where people would get together from different backgrounds, different fields of expertise, and share. It was a space, as Matt Ridley talked about, where ideas could have sex, right? This was their conjugal bed, in a sense. Ideas would get together there. And an astonishing number of innovations from this period have a coffee house somewhere in, in, in their story. I've been spending a lot of time thinking about coffee houses for the last five years uh, because I've been kind of in, on this quest to investigate this question of where good ideas come from. What are the environments that lead to unusual levels of innovation, um, unusual levels of, of, of creativity? What's the kind of environmental, what is the space of creativity? And what I've done is I've looked at both environments, like the coffee house, I've looked at like media environments, like the World Wide Web, that have been extraordinarily innovative. I've gone back to the, the, the history of the first cities. I've even gone to biological environments, like coral reefs and, and rainforests, that involve unusual levels of biological innovation. And what I've been looking for is shared patterns, kind of signature behavior that shows up again and again in all of these environments. Are there recurring patterns that we can learn from, that we can take and kind of apply to our own lives, or our own organizations, our own environments, to make them more creative and innovative. And I think I've found a few. But what you have to do to make sense of this and to really understand these principles is you have to do away with a lot of the, the way in which our kind of conventional metaphors and language steers us towards certain concepts of idea creation, right? We have this very rich vocabulary to describe moments of inspiration, right? We have the kind of the flash of insight, the stroke of insight, we have epiphanies, we have eureka moments, uh, we have the light bulb moments, right? All of these concepts, as, as kind of rhetorically florid as they are, share this basic assumption, which is that an idea is a single thing. It's something that happens often in a, in a wonderful, uh, illuminating moment. But in fact, what I would argue, and what you really need to kind of begin with, is this idea that an idea is a network on the most elemental level, right? I mean, this is what is happening inside your brain. An idea, a new idea, is a new network of neurons firing in sync with each other inside your brain. It's a new configuration that is never formed before, right? And the question is, how do you get your brain into environments where these new networks are going to be more likely to form? And it turns out that, in fact, the kind of network patterns of the outside world mimic a lot of the network patterns of the internal world of the, of the human brain. So the metaphor I, I'd like to use is actually, I can take from, from a story of, of a great idea um, that, that's quite recent, a lot more recent than the, the 1650s. Uh, a, a wonderful guy named Timothy Prestero who has a company called, an organization called Design That Matters. They decided to tackle this really pressing problem uh, of you know, the, the terrible problems we have with infant mortality rates in the, in the developing world. 
One of the things that's very frustrating about this is that we know by getting modern neonatal incubators into uh, you know, any context, if we can keep premature babies warm, basically, it's very simple, we can have infant mortality rates in those environments. So the technology is there, we have these, these are standard in, in all the industrialized worlds. The problem is, if you buy a $40,000 incubator and you send it off to a mid-sized village in Africa, it will work great for a year or two years, and then something will go wrong, and it will break, and it will remain broken forever. Because you don't have a whole system of spare parts, and you don't have the on-the-ground expertise to fix this $40,000 piece of equipment. And so you end up having this problem where you spend all this money getting aid and all this advanced electronics to these countries, and then it ends up being useless. So what Prestro and his team decided to do is to look around and say, what are the kind of abundant resources in these developing world contexts? And what they noticed was they don't have a lot of DVRs, they don't have a lot of microwaves, but they seem to do a pretty good job of keeping their cars on the road, right? There's a Toyota 4Runner on the, on the street in all, in all these places. They seem to have the expertise to keep cars working. So they started to think, could we build a neonatal incubator that's built entirely out of automobile parts? And this is what they ended up coming with. It's called the Neo Nurture device. From the outside, it looks like a normal little thing you'd find in a modern Western hospital. In the inside, it's all car parts. It's got a fan, it's got headlights for warmth, it's got door chimes for alarm, it runs off a car battery. And so all you need is the spare parts from your Toyota and the ability to fix a headlight, and you can repair this thing. Now, that's a great idea, but what I'd like to say is that, in fact, this is a great metaphor for the way that ideas happen. We like to think our breakthrough ideas you know, are like that $40,000 brand new incubator, state-of-the-art technology. But more often than not, they're cobbled together from whatever parts that happen to be around nearby. We take ideas from other people, from people we've learned from, from people we run into in the coffee shop, and we stitch them together into new forms and we create something new. That's really where innovation happens. And that means that we have to change some of our models of kind of what innovation and deep thinking really looks like, right? I mean, this is one vision of it. Another is Newton and the apple. This is a statue, though Newton was in Cambridge, this is a statue from Oxford, you know, where you're sitting there thinking a deep thought and the apple falls from the tree and you have a theory of gravity. In fact, the spaces that have historically led to innovation tend to look like this, right? This is Hogarth's famous painting of a kind of political dinner at a tavern, but this is what the coffee shops looked like back then. This is the kind of chaotic environment where ideas were likely to come together, where people were likely to have kind of new, interesting, unpredictable collisions, people from different backgrounds. So if we're trying to build organizations that are more innovative, we have to build spaces that, strangely enough, look a little bit more like this. This is what your office should look like. It's part of my message. And something about that environment, and I've started calling it the kind of the liquid network, where you have lots of different ideas that are together, different backgrounds, different interests, jostling with each other, bouncing off each other, that environment is, in fact, the environment that leads to innovation.